Hello and good afternoon. Um, firstly, let me say what a fantastic view this is to see so many people attending this event and to both catch up on what they've um, missed on sci fi technologies over the last couple of years because we've all been kind of locked away in our houses, um, but maybe to learn about some of the new technology that we've introduced over the last couple of years. Um, and I'm here to talk about our sci fi automotive solutions, which is one of this um, new family of products um, which Jack mentioned earlier on. Um, so automotive um, has been in, uh, it, it's an industry that's very much um, in, in kind of in, in moving fast but also moving slow. Um, you know, it's traditionally been seen as kind of slow moving but the technology that they need now um, requires new, new innovation in this area. So first of all, I'll, I'll kind of give you a recap on the portfolio slide um, and you'll see to the um, left-hand side of the slide is where we've positioned our automotive family. And what you'll find is that we're the only risk 5 vendor to offer such a breadth of portfolio targeting automotive. Um, so we have both low-end, mid-range, AI acceleration, and then also, as you'll see in a few slides' time, we're also talking about what's going to happen in the future um, in terms of very high performance, which Jack alluded to in his talk earlier on today. Um, so key for automotive is things like functional safety and adherence to standards, so ACLB, ACLD, and um, also flexibility that um, technology like SplitLock offers you, where you can both offer non-safety or safety applications to, 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 to reduce your chip costs effectively. So you'll see that the sci fi automotive family inherently um, um, kind of in, inherits itself technology from other, other parts of our portfolio. And this has enabled us to get to market very quickly with some solutions. Um, and and I'll, I'll go into detail on a couple of those in this presentation today. So what is it that's kind of so exciting about the automotive industry? So many people see now that the next generation of, of automotive will be about software-defined um, ve software vehicles. Um, and this is where the software is actually much more important for the capabilities and the, uh, the, the excellence that you expect from your product, um, but also bringing a lot more of the flexibility so you can en enable hardware by adding software um, throughout the lifetime of your vehicle, which is a, a kind of an interesting business model that some of the auto manufacturers are interested in, in, in following up on. But just from a basic kind of three levels of where we see um, market growth, um, ADAS is um, effectively adding safety features, automot automotive um, uh, safety features to the vehicles to aid the driver and make things easier for the driver. Um, and that kind of leads up to more levels of full autonomy as well. Um, we already have some levels of autonomy, um, but certainly not to the level five that maybe um, we're, we're looking towards in the, in the, in the, in the near future. I think it will be a little bit further out than, um, than, than the industry is perceiving at the moment. Um, but you're actually seeing multiple levels of investment across all um, areas of vehicle autonomy. So we see kind of different types of growth, maybe in the microcontroller area than you might find in the, um, in the SOC um, area itself. We're also seeing kind of fundamental changes in the architecture. So my, my migration to, um, you know, to, 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 to domain or, or zonal architecture. And that kind of involves the aggregation of multiple functions that used to be maybe on a single chip and, you know, where you have maybe two, two to three hundred microcontrollers within a vehicle. Um, you'll find consolidation of those into a more powerful chip. But that also then requires um, the ability to separate out the, the, um, the functions of the chips and enable them to execute um, um, on their own without interfering with other components within the device. Um, as I mentioned, there's a transition to high-performance central compute. Now, this is where Jack was alluding to in terms of you know, very high-performance um, capabilities. And you know, we're looking to lead the field both in RISC-V but also in the industry with um, the highest performance dedicated automotive processor. And I'll, I'll show you um, where we're targeting that um, say, later on. A big thing that is very interesting to automotive is a unified tool chain and a unified um, ISA, um, which uh, eases software um, portability and um, development. At the moment, what you might find is um, an automotive supplier maybe um, um, getting chips from multiple different companies. Um, maybe they've got their own proprietary ISA. 
Maybe they're using um, different architectures from, um, from um, using based on ARM, but using maybe an applications processor or an R-class processor, maybe an M-class processor. And fundamentally, they are different architectures. They may be based under the ARM umbrella, but they're actually different architectures. Whereas with RISC-V, everything is the same architecture. So the same ISA that is running on a 32-bit micro is applicable up the way to a, um, um, a high-end applications processor. You're basically just adding different type components of technology. Um, and then another thing that's very interesting, um, weirdly, kind of the market dynamics are, are interesting at the moment in, for electrification. Certainly in the UK, it's now actually cheaper to run a petrol car than it is an electric car because our gas and electric prices are so high that it's leveled out. So it'll be an interesting to see where le electrification goes um, depending on the, um, the, the kind of broader um, world e economy and, and, and um, ecosystem. So interesting growth in all three of those areas. And like I said, the kind of, there's, there's movements to changing of the architecture. And if you're going to change the architecture, why would you lock yourself into an architecture that is not really serving you um, in the same way Jack highlighted earlier on today? So what is it the industry is looking for? Um, and and the, the industry is looking for, the, each different parts of the industry is maybe looking for different um, solutions or different focus points. Silicon vendors have one idea, the tier ones are looking for something different, and then an OEM is maybe looking for something um, slightly different again. From a silicon vendor, they certainly want the most optimized PPA. So they need high performance or mid-range performance in the smallest area. Area equals power, Power in an electric car equals um, distance that you can actually travel. So the more you can reduce any kind of power consumption in a vehicle in an electric car, more than ever, means, means distance. It's a little bit easier to, to fill a, a, a combustion engine up um, from the petrol station in 10 minutes than it is to charge a car up over a number of hours, maybe. Um, the, um, the silicon vendors are also interested in... Um, Flexible IP and business models. They don't like being locked into the models that maybe they've been forced into over the last few years. Um, traditionally, the automotive market was very um, focused on proprietary architectures. Um, you know, they very much controlled what they needed to do and what they had to do. The problem with that is if you have your own architecture, that's thousands of millions of dollars of investment in, in design teams. And often what you are only able to do is focus on a particular space within a market because your design teams are not able to move between the different applications. So it's, it's really important to be able to, um, you know, be able to take advantage of what you had with your proprietary architecture, but in the flexibility that RISC V offers you. And as, as Jack said earlier on, you know, the, the request for RISC V in automotive has been coming for a long time, but actually it was more, maybe more important to actually get the baseline products ready first, um, you know, to be able to, to quickly migrate into automotive than focus on automotive um, as a driver. Um, so we think we made the right decision there, but certainly the inflection point is here now to, 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 to drive us into automotive. And we're seeing market success already. Some of our earlier products um, are already, um, you know, have been delivered to our customers and are, um, and are, are, be, are being um, put into silicon right now. So, you know, it, there's, a, there's a great future for um, both RISC V and SI V in IP, in, 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 in automotive. Um, Long-term support is a mandatory requirement in automotive. You know, you, customers need to be able to provide chips for at least 10 years, maybe 20 years, depending on the, on the specific market variant. Um, so long-term support is inherently going to be available through the RISC V ecosystem. You know, RISC V is not going to go away. It's going to be here for an awful long time. And you know, we, we've, we mentioned earlier on that the kind of failed acquisition by NVIDIA of ARM, that the existential threat that that actually could have brought to the industry has not been forgotten by anybody. Um, you know, it could be the case that the ARM ISA could, act, could actually have disappeared. And that, that's a business you know, business problem that many people could have faced. Um, now that has gone away for now, but you know, many other architectures have been around in the past and many of them will, 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 will move on, but RISC V is certainly here to stay. Tier ones, they like the idea of multi-sourcing, they like the idea of RISC V because they can move and port their software to devices supplied from multiple vendors, which is great. This is something they've always been very keen on. The proprietary architectures, was a problem for them because they could only buy from one vendor. 
um, when they wanted that type of architecture. Um, obviously, the Tier 1s, FUSA, functional safety, is mandatory. I'll talk a little bit more about functional safety um, in a few minutes' time. Um, and then OEMs. So the OEMs really suffered during the pandemic because people stopped giving them chips. Um, and so they've decided now that maybe actually we want to make our own chips. Um, and once again, the, the flexibility that RISC V offers gives them that flexibility. They could decide to put their own design team together or they could decide to come to Sci-5 and get, you know, get the, the, the products that they need from Sci-5 and then differentiate themselves with their own engineering team. Multiple options, multiple choices and all facilitated through RISC V itself. Um, and then you know, they, they need to be able to offer differentiated and cost-reduced ADAS solutions. So not every car is the same. What you get is different levels of car. But what you want to be able to do is Enable, be able to sell the same, maybe use the same chip, but actually control the capabilities by software. And so you need that kind of flexibility, but you also need the cost flexibility in that system as well. So where are we with automotive and RISC V? Well, over the last two to three years, you've seen a lot more um, announcements coming out from significant players in the automotive industry. Um, Renesis has actually um, announced a collaboration with Sci-5 um, which was, you know, kind of a, a game changer um, for them. They very often used proprietary architecture. I, mean, I think they were proprietary for many, many years, and they, they acquired architectures, which they then maintained the proprietary nature of those architectures. Um, but you're also seeing tools companies. You're seeing the European Processor Initiative kind of mandating the use of Risk Five. Um, Green Hills coming out. So the ecosystem is being more verbal about its support for Risk Five, um, which is a great progress. You know, there are it's still other ecosystem vendors that are working on solutions, so they're maybe not being very public about what they're doing at the moment. But certainly the momentum is, is there. Um, and we see the overall risk five momentum is, is very encouraging. And the automotive guys are now you know, confident that, that this is a solution that they can um, um, uh, be, be confident that it'll be around for a long time. So in terms of specifically sci-fi technology for automotive applications, so I've kind of gone through a few of the different examples of the types of applications. And you know, some of the older technology concepts and um, design methodologies will be around for a while. Meanwhile, there's you know, changes in terms of the electrification, the move to more hybrid vehicles, et cetera. So what you need is you need flexibility. Um, you need to be able to pick and choose the right processor for the right job within automotive. In some applications, you might need a very high-performant 64-bit CPU. For some other parts of the system, you might need a 32-bit um, CPU. And that's actually what we've brought to market first, um, as, as you'll see on a, a slide in a minute. Um, in terms of scalability, often you need to be able to move from single-core to multi-core to multi-cluster. Um, and at the same time, compensate with redundancy requirements. So you might have four-core, eight-core systems that actually are four cores in lockstep. Um, in order to provide the redundancy required for your applications. Vector computing is kind of a new area that is becoming very interesting in terms of both sensor, fum sensor fusion. Um, so our high-end apps processors have vectors included, but also the vector capabilities of the X280 could you know, er help in areas um, like sensor fusion, um, bringing in the sensor information from multiple components like LiDAR and radar and pre-processing them such that they can be executed in the most efficient way on a high-end processor without using up high-end processing capabilities to do that work. Um, IO virtualization, so the ability to um, you know, offer different levels of um, capabilities in terms of features on an, aut on an automobile. Um, a few years ago, I used to um, look at um, agriculture as a market industry for technology. And someone said, well, why, why do you need the ability for um, um, MMUs in, in automobiles. And the best example I could come up with was the idea of a tractor driving through a field and the tractor driver, who's actually not doing anything because the vehicle is mainly autonomous, is able to watch YouTube movies. Up until the vehicle actually, the tractor fails and goes outside of the field and onto the main road, in which, came the, in which case the real-time capabilities, the safety capabilities of the processor need to kick in and switch off YouTube and actually you know, save the driver 
and the um, and the and the cars on the freeway. So, you know, the, these kind of systems are becoming more and more apparent. Um, started off in agriculture. Agriculture always leads the way. But anyway, um, and then A C L B, A C L D in terms of functional safety and inherently in a safety um, safe vehicle, you need security. So you can be as safe as you like in terms of your systemic capabilities, but if you can be hacked, then the safety things can be switched off, uh, therefore you're no longer safe. So safety and security in automotive are nearly as important as each other and they go very much hand in hand. You have to have complete confidence in your security in order to be able to rely on your safety. So in terms of the portfolio, so you saw one, um, uh, do, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? One um, interpretation of our portfolio on our first slide, this kind of gives you how the processes fit into different market spaces. And as you'll see on the top right, I've actually included um, the product that we've got as our next generation automotive product. We haven't launched this product yet, so it doesn't have a name. I've put future, but bear in mind that this is the near future, not the distance future. Okay, we expect to have a product in this area as, you know, it, it's, it's already, um, you know, in development, nearly, nearly complete, and it'll be the fastest, um, most performant automotive targeted processor available anywhere. Bear in mind again what I said about an ISA and portability. So all four of these, are we doing that? I'm doing the wrong button. Um, all four of these families um, are all based upon the same ISA, the RISC V ISA, whether they be 32 bit or 64 bit. Um, and that's very important to someone of, who's involved in the software development. What they want to be able to do is use the same tool chain to target the different processes within the, within the, the vehicle. They don't want to have to use a specific tool chain for the small low-end microcontrollers providing safety island capabilities and then use a different tool chain for your high-end apps processor, multi-core, multi-cluster, Linux-based system. Um, so, the, the OEMs are really, really keen on RISC V in this area because it brings them a lot more control in terms of their costs for their software development and ease of development as well. So not, in just, not just in terms of the um, capital expenditure on tools, but also expenditure on, um, on software developers. It allows you to get to market faster, which obviously leads to revenue faster. So the two products I'm gonna talk about today in a bit more detail are the E6 family and the S7A family, E6A family and S7A family. So the E6A, um, fundamentally based on the essential E6 um, product that we've talked about today. So Drew um, showed earlier on, he talked a little bit more detail about essential. Um, so the essential E6 series is based on the 6 series, which was introduced in the last couple of years. Fundamentally, it's a 30, the, so the, um, the E component within E6 means it's uh, deeply embedded and 32-bit. So it's a 32-bit processor, so it's our smallest um, automotive processor that we offer. But it's still very, very powerful because it's an eight-stage pipeline processor, um, meaning that it can uh, um, effectively get up to about 1.91 DMIPS per megahertz. Um, it's single issue, um, full 32-bit physical addressing, and then the full range of floating point capabilities which are configurable depending on whether you want to include those in your system. So we're still offering the flexibility that the E6A that the E6 series offered, um, and we're bringing that capability, the flexibility um, into automotive where we can, where functional safety rules allow us to. And the E6A um, will be available in um, eight, eight core versions. Um, so you can be, if you're in um, uh, split, if you're in dual core lockstep mode, then four of those will be available and four of them will be redundant relative to each processor, et cetera. So this is our kind of microcontroller targeted solution. Um, if I now move up to our kind of safety island type high-end microcontroller capability. So the S7 series um, differs from the uh, E6 in that it's now a dual issue processor, so you get a significant uplift in performance. So you're now achieving 3.29. Um, DMIPS per megahertz, still an eight-stage processor. It's now superscalar because of the dual issuing. So the dual issuing means we can issue two instructions and more parallelize some of the, um, the flow. The S7A series will only be available in ACIL-D capability. Um, we don't see there's actually a need for ACIL-B, ACIL-Bravo at the moment. Um, but we have the flexibility um, to, 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 you know, 
chop and change what we need to do depending on market conditions. This is our kind of first stab at what our customers have been asking us to do, but we're not locked in stone on this one. Okay. So I said I would mention a little bit more on functional safety. So what, what, what is functional, functional safety and why is it important? So effectively, it's fundamentally um, part of the architecture of um, automobiles, right? And the, the, the description of it is absence of unreasonable risk due to hazards caused by malfunctioning behavior of electrical or electronic systems. Now, there's two types of malfunctioning behavior. One is where you've designed your system with errors built into it. So these are normally either a hardware bug that you haven't found or a software bug um, that um, is part of the system. So, and then the second part is um, the ability to um, capture things like bit flips, etc. cetera. Um, so when you have uh, vehicles in, in motion, etc., cetera, um, what can happen is there can be kind of ionic radiation where a, a, a bit could, could just be flipped accidentally, not by the system, but by the, the, the surrounding ecosystem around it. Um, and so what you need to be able to do is um, either identify and fix that problem or identify it, if an, and then depending if there's more than you can handle, you then hand it over to the system to actually implement um, um, a remedy system. And this, for some cars, that might be limp mode. Um, for cars that have got multiple levels of redundancy, then actually the chip might do a reset, um, and then there's knowledge that those, flip, those bits will be actually brought back into um, correct procedures, etc. So functional safety is both the way you design something and your, um, your processes in order for developing software for vehicles that will be used in safety applications, but also the ability to capture something that could happen accidentally in hardware later on that is outside of your control. So why do we need FUSA? Well, FUSA actually has different levels of capability. And effectively, the lower level of the requirement normally means it's less dangerous to human health, effectively. So an ACLB, ACL Bravo type application doesn't necessarily mean, if it, if it fails, that something in the vehicle could cause an accident and potentially cause you know, harm to human life. Um, as you move up to, to ACL D, then things are a lot more um, demanding in terms of the functional safety. Um, and so you have different kind of design methodologies, whether you're doing for B or D, and then different solutions for whether you're doing Bravo or Delta. Um, and obviously, if you're already in the automotive industry, then I'm kind of teaching to the, to the knowledgeable. But um, so, and what we're finding is that as become, vehicles become more autonomous, then there'll be more parts of the system will have to be A still D compliant. Um, because obviously you're relying completely on the vehicle to get you from one position to another safely um, and, and, and in a timely manner. So the higher the criticality, the less of the control the driver has, and so it, it's more demanding on the hardware effectively. And you'll see the diagram here, which I borrowed from our friends at Synopsys, and it gives you some examples. So, for example, a rear lights failure, that's not likely going to cause harm to the driver, whereas a failure in the airbag at the one point that it's actually needed could actually kill the driver because it's there as a safety mechanism and it's very time dependent, very real time dependent, very hardware focused. Um, and you know, if, if it's not designed properly, then there can be problems um, after market. And there's, there's various different applications and you'll see that there are different levels of complexity in terms of the hardware and software build out that, that are required um, in these systems. How is FUSA managed? Well, it's, it's part of an international standard. Um, what's interesting about um, ISO 26262 is that it's constantly kind of evolving and people like us are actually required to kind of help um, move that application forward. So we're constantly looking at if there can be improvements made in ISO 262 and, and we feed that back into the, in, into the organization. But it's part of a range of international safety standards for different application markets. But fundamentally, if you have automotive, then you're kind of like between 50 and 90% of the way towards the other um, uh, standard applicability as well. In terms of extra 
deliverables that you might get as part of automotive um, solutions from Sci5, we actually have to deliver a safety package. And there's three components to this package, the safety manual, the safety analysis report, and then kind of like an agreement between Sci5 and the, and the customer that will take this package as to what you're expecting from this package, what we expect you to use it for, and what you might not expect it for. So the safety manual is very much um, um, you know, details on the, the, the summary of, the, of what you're expecting, what the life cycle of the product, et cetera, is, and what tailoring we've done for ISO 26262. And then the safety analysis report is the actual report from normally an independent assessor. We've talked about ecosystem an awful lot today, um, and I think in automotive, um, you know, the ecosystem has been around for a long time. There's been vehicles in the car on the road since Henry Ford built the, um, the Model T. I don't think there was much aware of the ecosystem back then, but you know, what you'll see is that as more and more the market has evolved, you know, people have required third parties to provide software and, um, um, and uh, consultancy services for the automotive industry. Um, it's very important that when you go to market with automotive products that you have support from that ecosystem. This is a snapshot from when we launched um, in the market today. Um, we're still working with other vendors. There are other key vendors who are very keen, um, but are kind of keeping their situation under wraps at the moment. But certainly, if you need to get started, then you have a, a solution now. So if you would talk to me, if, ask me you know, three words that are important in Sci-Fi Automotive. So it's advanced. It's, it's advanced features. It's the capability to bring the latest and greatest both IP technology, RISC V technology, but also you know, general knowledge that we've, has been built up over the industry over the last um, 20 or 30 years. We're bringing that to market with our products, multi-core, multi-clusters, flexibility, the new vectors that we've talked about today, virtualization security. You need to be able to you know, make sure that you achieve your power envelope um, constraints. You know, what you'll be able to be able to do is offer the longest you know, charge between, um, the longest drive between charges, the not largest mileage, et cetera or even just how much your fuel consumption can range. Safety standards, FUSA is fundamentally part of a, a package, a solution that you'd get from any automotive um, IP vendor. Um, and you need to know that you get all of the options that you might need to, to get. I've just mentioned ecosystem, but you know, ecosystem and portfolio fit hand in hand because what you want to be able to do is offer from the low end to the high end. Um, and and the, the, the ability that RISC V offers in terms of single ISA is, is so appealing to the industry. Um, you know, it just makes the, the, the OEM's life so much easier um, in terms of how much complexity they're having to add and they want to reduce as much of that complexity that they can. So my final point is, you know, this actually is very good for Sci-5 because we, do, we, we call it the automotive family, but it's not actually just dedicated to automotive. Automotive is probably the most um, marketable name that we could think of. Um, but actually, a lot of the work that we're doing is actually transferable into other markets. So things like medical products and um, industrial automation. A lot of those, if they're used in certain circumstances, require, functional, re require additional safety. It wouldn't be, be called functional safety. It wouldn't be called ACL B, ACL D. Um, it might be called something else, but they're quite similar across the industry. Um, so, you know, this is actually a product line that will actually go broader than automotive. Um, and we're looking for um, um, far more success in, in a broader range of markets um, where, where, where functional safety has an inherent advantage. So why Sci-5? Effectively, you've got the breadth of the portfolio um, with all of the safety capabilities. You've got the most advanced technology um, in the automotive market. No other vendor is able to offer the same breadth that we offer nor the same highest performance at the same time within the same ISA, um, which is critical. Um, we've, we've built up a significant um, amount of resource in the company. Um, you know, we've got um, architects, safety managers, etc. We've kind of gone out to the industry and picked the kind of people that we want in order to make this market successful. And you know, finally, the ecosystem. Ecosystem is just the thing, the icing on the cake. Um, the bigger the ecosystem, the stronger the ecosystem then um, um, it, it just enables you to get to pro markets to product, products to market faster. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much.